What's going on, family? Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov Series. Let's continue with 100 years of world championship fights. February 8, 1924, World Flyweight Champion Pancho Villa defeats Georgie Marks in 15 rounds, New York's Madison Square Garden, in defense of his World Flyweight Championship belt. Now, who was Georgie Marks? He was born December 28, 1900, United Kingdom. He died February 5, 1933. He was 32 years of age at the time of his death. And he would reside in Los Angeles, California. Now, he stood 5 foot 2 inches. He was a man away. He had a 69-inch reach. Fought from 1917 to 1926. Had over 100 fights with 73 wins, 13 losses, 7 knockouts, and 15 draws. He was in a ring with fighters such as Teddy Silver, Abe Goldstein, who he lost to, Frankie Genazzo, June 16, 1925, and August 7, 1925. Fought him twice. Tony Canzanari, September 20th, 1926, lost to him in six rounds. P. Sarmento, very good Filipino fighter, an outstanding one at that, lost to him. September 23rd, 1925. Now, I rank P. Sarmento, along with Pancho Villa, Little Flash Elote, and a very good fighter of modern day. His name is Manny Pacquiao. It was interesting because a lot of them were southpaws. They were all champions. They were all dynamic fighters. So Pancho Villa would defeat Georgie Marks February 8th, 1924 in defense of his flyweight championship belt in New York's Madison Square Garden. Friday, February 15th, 1924. America's light heavyweight champion fighting Marines. 26-year-old Gene Tunney defends his crown against 27-year-old Martin Berkey. 15 rounds, New Orleans Coliseum Arena. Now, the referee was Al Wamscans. 15-round decision was given to the fighting Marine, Gene Tunney. Now, who was Martin Berkey? Now, Martin Joseph Berkey was born September 10, 1896 in New Orleans, Louisiana. He died September 18, 1978. He was 82 years of age at the time of his death, and he would reside in Louisiana, New Orleans. He stood 6 foot 3 inches. He was a light heavyweight and had a 79 and a half inch reach. Fought from 1919 to 1929. Had a total bout career of 87 fights, 52 wins, 26 losses, and 23 by the knockout route. Now, he would fight a fighter by the name of George K. O. Brown. Very good fighter he was. Defeated him in 15 rounds. Al Ricci, 15 rounds. George Chip. And George Chip was a middleweight champion who would defeat Frank Klaus. He also had a brother by the name of Joe Chip who would knock out Harry Grab. Was also in the corner, Jack Dempsey, 1919. Toledo, Ohio, when he was against Jess Willard. And the thing about it, what was very interesting about that fight, Martin Berkey would lose that fight because he quit. He couldn't continue because of a broken bone in his chest from a straight right hand from George Chip. But also being in the ring with Bob Martin. Pillsbury went to Garden. Bob Martin was the heavyweight champion of the AEF. Was also in the ring with Chuck Wiggins three times and lost to him three times. Billy Miss out of St. Paul, Fred Fulton, and Johnny Risco. He was known as the Cleveland Baker Boy or the Rubber Man. But also found himself in the ring with Bill Tate, Harry Greb, who he lost to, and Jimmy Delaney. So the fighting Marine, Gene Tunney, would defend his America's Light Heavyweight Championship belt on the night of Friday, February 15th, 1924 against Martin Berkey. March 14th, 1924. Light heavyweight of Bridgeport, Connecticut. 23-year-old Jack Delaney. He had a very good scare against Paul Berlinbatch. Because Paul Berlinbatch was from Queens, New York. He was a light heavyweight champion when he defeated Mike Matigue. And Paul Berlinbatch was 23 years old in his fight. He was on the floor in the fourth round in New York's Madison Square Garden. But Paul Berlinbatch would be dropped three times. And what was interesting, he would gather himself, survive for the final 15th spell, and he would remain champion. But in 1926, which I'll show you later, he would wind up losing to Jack Delaney. And Jack Delaney would wind up becoming the world light heavyweight champion. Now, who was Jack Delaney while we're on the subject? Avilia Chapani. Called him Bright Eyes. He was born March 18, 1900. And he died November 27, 1948. He was 48 years of age at the time of his death and he would reside in Bridgeport, Connecticut. 
stood five foot eleven inches. He was a light heavyweight and had a seventy three and a half inch reach. And he fought from nineteen nineteen to nineteen thirty two. Had a fight career of eighty eight wins. Seventy three of those wins were by decision. Eleven losses and forty three by the knockout rule. Let me correct that record because it's in my mind. It's 88 total bouts, 73 wins, 11 losses, and 43 knockouts. And he was in a ring with fighters such as Maxi Rosenblum, and Tommy Lockley, Phil Johnson, who he stopped in two rounds. Phil Johnson was the father of Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson was in a ring with Archie Moore six times. He would win one and lose five to Archie Moore. But we'll talk about Phil Johnson, who was the father of Howard Johnson, a little further on in the series. They have a very interesting coalition between those two men, although they were father and son. It was because they were father and son what makes it so interesting. And he was also in a ring, Jack Delaney, I'm referring to, to Jack Sharkey, Tom Heaney, and Mike Matigue, along with a few others. He was a very good fighter, and we'll be discussing him a little further on in the series. Friday, March 21st, 1924. Bantamweight Al Goldstein, 25 years old. I'm sorry, Abe Goldstein. He defeats World Bantamweight champion, 25-year-old Joe Lynch. 15 rounds in New York's Madison Square Garden to become the new World Bantamweight champion and a New York Sack Bantamweight champion. Now, Goldstein was 5'5". Five five. He had a 64-inch reach. He had a fight of 83 wins, 12 losses, and 32 knockouts. Joe Lynch was five foot six inches and he had a 60 centimeter reach. 97 wins, 30 losses, and 36 knockouts. Now, the man you're looking at is Black Bill. Fantastic fighter. I'm going to get into Black Bill's career as we move on into the series. But Ghosting, you know, he was something else. He was in a ring with fighters such as Tommy Ryan, Pancho Vila, Joe Lynch himself, jo- uh, Chick Shugs, Franco Gennaro. And Georgie Marks, just to give an example. And Lynch was in a ring with P. Sarmento, Memphis Pound Moore, and Midget Smith, and Joe Berman, and, and uh, Pete Herman, just to give an example of some of the fighters both men were in the ring with. But this fight would take place fr- uh, Friday, March 21st, 1924. And Ernie Goldstein would defeat Joe Lynch, and he would take the claim of the World Bantamweight Champion. Monday, March 24th, 1924, world middleweight champion, Pittsburgh Windmill, 29-year-old Harry Gregg knocks out 30-year-old Faye Kaiser. Now, Faye Kaiser was an opponent for who I spoke about, Bob Martin, with the AEF, America's Expeditionary Forces, in the heavyweight division. Well, Faye Kaiser would be in the ring with Harry Gregg seven times. And uh, these men would fight each other in Baltimore, Maryland. 104th Regiment in the Army. The referee was Benny Franklin. He was scheduled for 15 rounds. Faye Kaiser. His name was Faye Walter Kaiser. Fought from 1914 to 1928. He had 46 total bouts. 22 wins, 18 losses, and 10 by the knockout rule. He was born October 17, 1893 in Greenwich, Ohio. When he died, September 2, 1971 in Cumberland. He stood five foot ten and a half inches. He was a middleweight and had a seventy-seven inch reach. And what was interesting about him, you know, he he was more than just a fighter. He was a brawler. He was in a ring with fighters such as Jimmy Slattery, Junk Stribling, Jeff Smith, Gene Tunney, Bob Martin, Leo Florian Hawk, and Tommy Lockwood. All outstanding fighters I just mentioned. Now Greb didn't weigh in because. Kaiser didn't come in exactly the way he should have. They walked in at 160 pounds, but remember, the middleweight championship limit was 158 during those years. And Harry Grubb just said the hell with it, and he didn't walk. He never weighed in for that fight. Never weighed in. He just said, you know, we're going to fight or we're not going to fight, but I'm not weighing in. And the fight was sanctioned. There's two men got it on, and Harry Grubb remains the middleweight champion of the world. Very interesting fight that was. March 31st, 1924, World Light Heavyweight Champion Mike Matigue remains champion after a controversial victory decision. According to the Newark News, 
paper in Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Young. So we called him Young Stribling. And he won the fight. Now, referee Harry Urtel awards the Lawrence uh, Young Stribling the victory. But he was overruled by the other newspaper men. And um, Mike Mateague would remain champion. And it was said that Mike Mateague came into the ring gun, uh, gunpoint. You know, he didn't want to walk into the ring and he had a gun to his head. And he also claimed he had a broken hand. Roughly, Harry Urtel had to stop the fight. And when he stopped the fight, he, he gave the title to Mike Mateague, who was already the champion. It was such a controversial fight. Most people thought that Young Stribling had won. And Mike Mateague, he got away with one that night. So I don't know if any x-rays were done, but it was stated that he broke his hand, according to Mike Mateague. And it was also stated that he was walking to the ring with someone pointing a gun at him. He wasn't comfortable in the ring and his hand was broken. So they ended the contest. So that happened March 31st, 1924. It was in defense of the light heavyweight championship belt of Mike Mateague. May 30th, 1924, World Flyweight Champion of the Philippines, Pancho Vila defeats Frankie Ash after a world-class 15-round boxing lesson in Brooklyn, New York. It's at the Henderson Bowl. And he will remain the World Flyweight Champion. Now, who was Frankie Ash? He was born June 27th, 1898. And he died May 2nd, 1973. He was 74 years of age at the time of his death. He was a flyweight. Now, total bouts of 140 fights. 80 wins, 42 losses, 15 knockouts, and he was stopped nine times. Now, he fought from 1914 to 1933. He was in the ring with fighters such as Kid Francis. Very good fighter was Fritz, uh, Kid Francis. I got to do a profile on him. Panama Al Brown, another dynamic fighter he was. Corporate Izzy Swartz and Johnny Buff, just an example of some of the fighters that uh, Frankie Ash was in the ring with. But um, let me just show you Panama Al Brown. We're going to be going through his career you know, during the course of this series, but let's take a look at Panama Al Brown for one moment. Now, here's Panama Al Brown. I'll break down his uh, career and his profile when we get to him a little later on in the 1930s. But Panama Al Brown was some fighter. I just thought of him, so I said, let me show him to you. But a dynamic uh, fighter, very good bantamweight, was Panama Al Brown. Monday, June 2nd, 1924. World Welterweight Champion, 22 year old Mickey Walker. Defeats Philadelphia lightweight Southpaw, 25-year-old Lou Tendler. Was in a 10-round affair, Philadelphia Shrine Park. And Mickey Walker will remain the world welterweight champion of the world. Now remember, Lou Tendler, who's a Southpaw, went at it with Benny Leonard. That was some fight. And Benny Leonard had broke his hand in that fight. Because it was very unorthodox for him to try to handle a man like that. Because... Quite as it's kept, a lot of the old time historians always considered Lou Tendler the greatest Southpaw. Now, obviously, throughout the years, you had other Southpaws, Michael Nunn and others. Uh, Terrence Crawford, when he reverses his uh, stance, is a very good Southpaw. Marvin Hagler, uh, Earl Spence, you have some very good Southpaws, but Lou Tendler was something else during his time. So, uh, Lou Tendler, in fact, you know, let's talk about Mickey Walker for one moment. Mickey Walker was 22 years old. He stood five foot seven inches, and he had a 17, uh, 70 inch reach. And he had 64 total bouts with 12 losses and two draws with 29 by the knockout rule. And he knocked out a fighter by the name of Wildcat Nelson, February 15, 1924. Lou Tendler was 25 uh, years old at that time. He stood five foot six inches, and he had a 70 inch reach, and he had 119 total bouts under his belt. 10 losses, he had 5 draws and 27 knockouts. I'm trying to keep this in my mind. He knocked out Pinky Mitchell February 18, 1924. And that was very impressive at that time. Pinky Mitchell was the brother of Richie Mitchell. 
you're looking at the first junior welterweight champion in 1922, the Mitchell. So Mickey Walker was something else. He was a very, very good fighter. But I have a lot to say about Mickey Walker as the series goes on. We're fighting with Harry Grab and Tiger Flowers. But he was something else. He was in a ring with, you know, um, as a matter of fact, he fought Jack Sharkey to a, uh, a draw, 15-round draw. And then two weeks later, Jack Sharkey wound up becoming the world heavyweight champion. He um, was knocked out by Max Schmeling. He was in the ring with everybody, but we'll get to his career as we move on in this series. June 20th, 1924, Steve Kidd Sullivan defeats junior lightweight champion, Scott Schwab, Johnny Dundee, 10 rounds, and wins the crown at the Henderson Bowl in Brooklyn, New York. The referee was Jack O'Sullivan. He was the same referee that would referee Dixie Kidd and the Barbados Demon, Joe Walcott. Very controversial fight that took place in 1904. But uh, he awards Kit Sullivan the World Junior Lightweight Championship belt. The National Sports Alliance was a relief fund card. In June 9, 1924, Sammy Mandel. And uh, he would defeat Johnny Dundee. On August 20th, 1924, Dundee vacates the featherweight championship belt, moves up in class. So Johnny Dundee was an outstanding fighter. He had a lot of fights. So it seems like the losses he had, it's like he's always losing. That was towards the end of his career. But Johnny Dundee, what's interesting about him, 1913, he would have his first crack at a title shot with Johnny Kilbane. And it was, Johnny Dundee was about 18 years old at that time. And 1923 was when Johnny Dundee would get his next opportunity, 10 years later. Johnny Kilbane would remain champion for 10 years, but he would never fight Johnny Dundee again. And Eugene Creek would take the title away from, from uh, Johnny Kilbane, but Johnny Dundee would take the title away from Eugene Creek. So it was very interesting. But Johnny Dundee was all over the place. He was a Scott Swap. He could work the ropes like you won't believe. I'll tell you. Unbelievable fighter with Johnny Dundee. I have him ranked number nine collectively with Benny Leonard as well as Tony Canzanari. Thursday, June 26, 1924. World middleweight champion, 30-year-old Harry Greb. Defeats 23-year-old Ted Moore in 15 rounds. Bronx, New York's Yankee Stadium. He remains the world middleweight champion of the world. When a referee, Eddie Perkley, had said he had enough. And um, although it won 15 rounds, but Harry Greb was really just doing a number on Ted Moore, who was actually a very good fighter, by the way. And uh, Greb was five foot seven, uh, eight inches. He had a 71 inch reach. He had a record of 20, 222 wins, 15 losses, 16 draws, and 39 knockouts. And Ted Moore was five foot 10 inches. He had a 50 winning streak and eight losses and two draws with 20 knockouts. And Ted Moore was in the ring with Jamaica Kidd, May 17, 1924, Dave Shiggs, February 1st, 1924, and Larry Estridge, January 19, 1924. Those are his last three fights before he went in the ring with Harry Greb. As for Harry Greb, he was in the ring with Martin Berkey, Powell Reed, Kid Norford, Faye Kaiser, before he got into the ring with Ted Moore. So that was a very good fight between those two men. But the referee, Eddie Perkley, you know, he he didn't like what he was seeing towards the end of the fight. And um, they let it go all the way, but he kept a close eye on Ted Moore. Ted Moore was a good fighter, but Harry Greb was something else. June 26, 1924, America's light heavyweight champion, Gene Tunney, knocks out Amino Spada in seven rounds in New York Yankee Stadium which is in the Bronx, New York. And the referee was Eddie Purdy. And uh, it was a pretty good fight up until, you know, it lasted. But Emilio Sparney, you know, let's talk about him. He fought from 1919 to 1934. He had total bouts of 56 fights, 43 wins, 10 losses, and 31 knockouts. He was born July 7th, 1897 in Italy, and he died August 14th, 1971 in uh, Italy. He stood six foot one inch. He was a heavyweight, and he lost to Victoria Campolo. He was from Argentina. He was six foot nine with an eighty inch reach. Amazing. He was three and zero at that time. Polino Oscar Don, twenty two two and one. 
Louis Angel Firpo lost to him twice, 26 and 3. Now, all those men that I mentioned, all Argentinians, except for Polino Escudon. He was from Spain. And the thing with Polino Escudon, he would be the fighter. I, we'll get to that. But Max Melling would watch Polino Escudon face Joe Lewis. And he saw that Joe Lewis's arm kept on dropping, his left arm, every time he would jab. And that's when he realized, I have a weapon for that particular problem that Joe Lewis has. And we'll go into Joe Lewis, you know, in the 1930s, and I'll explain all what problems Joe Lewis had with his arm and everything else. But it was a fighter by the name of Pettit Van Der Veer. I was have problems pronouncing his name. Pettit Van Der Deer. He won the um, the vacant EBU European heavyweight title from him. You know, did uh, Amino's father. So that was an opportunity for him to get somewhat of a title, but he couldn't get the America's light heavyweight championship belt from... Uh, Gene Tunney June 26, 1924 Now let's continue July 24, 1924 America's light heavyweight champion 27-year-old Gene Tunney Knocks out 30-year-old Orchard man George Compartier 15 rounds in New York's polo grounds 30,000 excited spectators George Compartier was dropped By Tunney in the 10th round He was dropped three times And Gene Tunney he was six foot and he had a 76 inch reach and George Compartier was five foot 11 and he had a 73 inch reach. Just take a look at that fight because that was very impressive. As a matter of fact, it was that fight that would, you know, let everyone know that he was ready for a, uh, Jack Dempsey when Jack Dempsey would make a return uh, to the ring. So here you have Gene Tunney facing the orchard man, George Compartier. George Compartier is the one stretched out on the ground. The referee is telling Gene Tunney to give George Compartier some room. He didn't have to go to a neutral corner yet. That didn't take place until 1927 when Jack Dempsey had put it in the rule book. But the man who had knocked down a fallen fighter had to go to a neutral corner. And we'll get into that in 1927. But you can see the referee escorting Gene Tunney over to his corner because the fight is now over and George Compartier is staggering on his own trying to get out. Tony's victory over Compartier. Now, George Compartier was a very, very good fighter. He had multiple opportunities with these fighters during those years. He was in the ring in 1921 with Jack Dempsey to Manasseh Mola. He was in the ring with a lot of fighters during his day. But he was really a light heavyweight. Here you have George Compartier on the scale and Gene Tunney on the right looking in. I just want you to get an idea of what this fight was like. Tunney stops George Compartier, is what it's saying, in 15 rounds. I'm power phrasing. Frenchman's claim a foul was ignored. So he tried to claim a foul against Gene Tunney. See, George was floored three times by Gene in the 10th round. It was a left to the solar plexus and the 14th. It was the deciding blow. Now, I want you to look at something. Now, remember Bob Fitzsimmons, who was also a light heavyweight champion. He challenged Jim Corbett, Carson City, Nevada. And he hit him with a solar plexus punch. Here is Gene's explanation of a low or of the blow that knocked out George Compartier. I want you to read that. And then we're gonna look at something else here. George shoots his right. Now George Compartier knocked out uh, Joe Beckett. Joe Beckett was supposed to face Jack Dempsey in 1919. I think I went over that in the other video. So that's how George Compartier got the shot. But Kid Norfolk had challenged Jack Dempsey back in 1918 before he was champion and he refused that fight. All right, let's move on to some more championship fights. Here we go to Solar Plexus Punch.
August 11th, 1924, world lightweight champion ghetto wizard Benny Leonard had his hands full in the 10th round, no decision contest against Powell Morgan. Benny Leonard remains champion. That was some fight between these two men. But he defended his world lightweight championship crown. September 11th, 1924, the colored heavyweight champion. It was called the colored title. So I want to be clear, the colored heavyweight champion, 32-year-old Harry Wells, dominated 29-year-old Argentinian Luis Andrew Firpo. 12 rounds, no decision match. I'm going to highlight no decision match. After dropping Firpo down in the second round, it was Jersey City's uh, Boyles 30 Acres. The referee was Danny Sullivan, 12 rounds. Now Firpo, he was called the Wild Bull of the Andes, or the Panthers. He was born October 11, 1894. Boyles, uh, how do you say that? The Andes, <laughs> Buenos Aires. Uh, he died August 7th, 1960. He was 65 years of age at the time of his death. And um, he stood six foot two and a half inches. He was a heavyweight and had a 79 inch reach. He fought from 1917 to 1936. Had a total bout career of 36 fights, 31 wins, four losses, 29 knockouts, and he was stopped a few times. Now, Harry Wills was 32 years old. He stood six foot two inches, and he had an 84 inch reach. Louis Angel Firpo was 29 years old. He stood six foot two and a half inches and had a 79 inch reach. I want to show you the fight between these two men. What was so unjustifiable about this fight was that Harry Wills was promised a title shot with. Uh, Jack Dempsey in 1924. In fact, they had a legal contract. Everything was signed and ready to go. And Tex Fickard had taken the blame for that, stating that he was going to have to fight in Jersey City. But he spent so much money on that stadium, he didn't want another riot that ha like happened, you know, in 1910 with Jess Willard and, um, I'm sorry, Jim Jeffries and Jack Johnson. I have to stop misspeaking here. And that was very interesting because Tex Rickard wanted to fight, but Jack Dempsey really didn't want to fight. So Tex Rickard had ticked the blame for the, you know, not making that fight come off. And there were so many excuses that was made. But I say that to say that Joe Jeanette had faced all the opponents that Jack Dempsey fought from Furpo on. He defeated them all. And Jack Dempsey never gave him a shot. Dempsey would retire for a few years. He would come back in 1926 and he would face Gene Tunney and he would lose to Gene Tunney, Philadelphia. We'll get to that. Meanwhile, Jess Willard um, has spoken to Jack Dempsey because he sparred with Harry Wills. And Harry Wills did a job on Jess Willard. Well, Louis Angel Furpo also faced Jess Willard. He dropped Jess Willard and he defeated Jess Willard. But Louis Angel Furpo later on stated that Harry Wills was a harder puncher than Jack Dempsey. Now, that was amazing to believe, but that's what he said because he went two rounds with Jack Dempsey in 1923, did Louis Angel Furpo. And both those men went down a total of nine times. It was incredible. In the first round, Dempsey went out of the ring. I showed you that in a previous video. But Eventually, he would wind up losing to Jack Sharkey. He was just, you know, past his prime at that point. And they say that he was getting handled pretty good by Jack Sharkey. But they got him for excessive holding. And for that reason, they stripped him of his colored uh, heavyweight championship belt. So it was total injustice all the way around. But let's take a look at that fight between Harry Wills and Louis Angel Furbo. Now, Furpo wasn't a bad fighter. He wasn't a great fighter. He was kind of clumsy, but he, he was not a bad fighter. Here you see him with Jess Willard. And as you can see here, he knocks down Jess Willard. He winds up taking the fight away from Jess Willard. Furpo knocks out Jess Willard. All right, let me show you and my, I have a black boxing scrapbook, two of them, 1,000 pages each, 2,000 front and back, 4,000 pages of nothing but black fighters. Let me get that book out. Now I'm going to end this video and start another video 
and continue with 1924. My goal is to try and get to 1929 by Friday. But I just want to show you this fight right here. This is between Harry Wells and Louis Angel Furpo. And as you can see here, Louis Angel Furpo knocks down, is knocked down by uh, Harry Wells. Second round. He gets up clumsy and he staggers. But yet, they make it a 12 round no decision. And Harry Wills handled Firpo the entire fight with no problem. And I'm going to show you how that's unjust. Let me show you in one moment. Now, here you see Firpo hitting the heavy bag. This is a different book that I'm showing you. Believe it or not, half of this book is Louis Angel Furpo. Would you believe it? But this is Furpo. Takes a bad beating from we're not. And look at this one. Furpo knocks out. Spala, 14 rounds. One of errors. And that's the same fighter that Gene uh, Tunney had defeated. And I show you this because... With Furpo, he was given an opportunity either to win or lose a fight. There was no decisions. And with Wills, they ruled it as a no decision. Because they didn't want to give the victory or make it seem that there was something not going on right in 